Good morning and welcome to Go Church Bradford's online service. My name is Simon and I'm a member of this wonderful church family here in Bradford, West Yorkshire. Thank you for joining with us today. I'm really excited to have you here. And I believe that you haven't joined us by chance, but rather that God has directed you to us. It would be great to know where in the world you're joining us from, so please do leave us a message in the comments to let us know. And if you managed to join us a little earlier, let us know how you got along in our Disney trivia quiz before the service. It would be really good to know how people are getting along with the little quizzes that we put together for you. Go Church Bradford is part of the Go Church family. We've got family in Beirut, Liverpool, Manchester and of course here in Bradford. Our vision is that we are a family of churches working together to reach the world and we want to reach the world with the love of God which is shown in our values love, grow and go. Our heart for you is that you would experience God's love, that you would grow in God's love and that you would go with his love. Shortly, we'll be starting our time together with a time of praise and worship. During this time, I'd like to encourage you to really engage and connect in your heart. Set aside any distractions and give God your full attention and focus. You know, the Bible tells us that God inhabits the praises of his people. So expect his presence to flood your room, wherever that may be, as you worship him from your heart. The words will be on screen, so please do join with us as we worship. Then after our time of praise and worship, I'll be back with a short prayer before Pastor Matthew brings us the second part in our sermon series, Dressed to the Nines. We pray that the word of God will impact you today and that you'll be able to understand and hear his heart for you. So we encourage you to have a faith expectation that you will receive the word of God in a fresh way so that we may all continue to grow. After the sermon, we'll then close our service with one final song but then we'd like to invite you to join us after today's service in our Zoom virtual coffee shop. The login details are on screen now and they will pop up again during and at the end of the service. This is a great time of fun and fellowship and a wonderful opportunity to get to know each other better. And if the opportunity arises, even for us to pray together. Lastly, as we move towards our time of worship, I'd like to ask you to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel, or if you're watching on Facebook, share or even start a watch party. When you do, it enables these messages to have an even greater impact all over the world. But right now, why don't you join in and sing along with us as we worship our God. sing 
just want you The Lord of my soul The King of my heart Jesus is you Let us pray. Father, thank you for a wonderful time of worship this morning, Lord God. Father, I thank you for your presence with us as we worshiped, Lord. Father, that uh, each and every person, Lord God, that has been with us this morning in our time father that you that they would have felt that presence and that they would have really been refreshed in you through our time together this morning and lord as we come now to your word lord god father i pray for pastor matthew i pray that you would anoint the words that he speaks father that those words would reach out to each and every person that is listening, whether it be live now or whether it be on catch up later on, Father. We know, Lord, that each and every person can receive something from the word this morning. So I pray, Lord, that you would open our ears and our hearts to receive what you have got for each of us individually this morning, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, Amen. Hey there and welcome back. My name is Matthew Tapso and I, along with my Amazing wife, and I pastor this church called Go Church Bradford, which is based in one of the most tremendous cities in Yorkshire, and that's Bradford. And this week we are continuing our sermon series, which is titled Dress to the Nines, and it's all about clothing ourselves in an attribute that God absolutely loves. He loves to see it in his people, he loves to see it in his kids, he loves to see it actually in any person of the world. It's an attribute that releases so much of God's blessing, his favor, his goodness. And his grace in our lives and that's humility now first peter 5 5 says likewise you younger people submit yourselves to your elders yes all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility for god resists the proud but gives grace to the humble therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of god that he may exalt you in due time so let's have a quick review of last week's message last week we said that what is humility and we saw that humility is not what a lot of people think it is. It's not walking around saying that you're worthless and despising yourself. That's not what true humility is. No, true humility believes the truth and submits to it. Pride believes lies and lives in deception. And we saw that God's word is his standard of truth and that humility can be described as simply choosing to agree with what God's word says about everything. Whereas pride is the act of exalting your own opinion or feelings above what God's word says is true. We saw that humility is something we put on, that living in humility is our choice. It's your choice and my choice. It's a decision that we make and then act upon. We get to decide what suit will we put on, the suit of pride or the suit of humility. Actually, if you are living in humility, then you are to be commended because you made a decision to live that way. Now don't go around boasting about humility, you just went in the other direction. You just went in pride. But if you are walking in humility, if you are a doer of the word of God, that's true humility. It's being a doer of the word of God. Then you are to be commended. And we also said that humility releases God's amazing grace in our lives. God's grace is available to us all. It's available to us through what Jesus has done. It's already there for you and for me, but he only gives it to the humble. And we said that there are differing aspects of God's grace that can be released in our lives. The grace to be strong. When the storms of life come, then we need strength to stand against them. The grace to minister unto others, to minister to God and to minister unto the people around us. The grace to be a blessing, to give unto others 
and the grace of God to live a holy life. And that is possible to grow in the grace of God, to increase in the grace of God. Listen to the scripture, 2 Peter 1 verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Looking at this, I'm like, wow, not just grow in God's grace, which is wonderful, but multiplication of the grace of God in our lives. Multiplication in God's divine help. Now that's something I think we could all do with. Not just growing, but multiplying in the grace of God. In the strength, in the ability, in the giving, in the ability to live a holy life, multiplying in all those areas. Not just growing in God's amazing grace, which is great, but multiplying in the amazing grace of God. Humility qualifies you to be used by God. Pride disqualifies you from being used by God. And before we get into word, I want to recommend two books that have been a real help and a blessing to me in this area of humility. And that's Humility by Andrew Murray, fantastic book, and Humility by Pat Williams. So let's jump to the Bible and continue to see what God says about humility. And firstly, we must grow in humility because we all have to deal with pride. And humility is the antidote to pride. Proverbs 29 verse 23 says, Pride ends in humiliation while humility brings honor. Humility is probably one of the more difficult fruits of the Spirit to develop, but possibly one of the most important ones that we need to work with the Holy Spirit on because humility is the antidote for pride. Now, antidotes are a medicine that counteracts and negates the effect of a poison or a toxin. Now, there are plenty of animals worldwide from spiders, scorpions, jellyfish, certain types of fish that can have quite negative effects on people because of poison or venom. But probably the one that really stands out to me the most are venomous snakes. They have a poison, a venom, that when injected into people can cause physical death. There are so many types of poison snakes, from rattlesnakes to pit vipers, coral snakes, king cobras, to the most poisonous snake in the world apparently, the inland taipan, or they call it the fear snake. Now when you get bitten by a venomous snake and the poison is now running in your veins, what you need is the antidote. You need the antidote to counteract and negate the effect of that poisonous venom. Now, differing venomous snake species, they can have quite different venoms from one another, and they can have quite different effects on our bodies. Some of them cause muscle paralysis by attacking the nervous system, while others cause severe blood loss. You know, others are a combination of both. But what you need when you get bitten is the antidote. Galatians 5, 22, 23 says, But the Spirit produces love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, humility, and self-control. There is no law against such things as these. So we see here the nine fruits of the Spirit. And each one of these fruits is an antidote for a specific spiritual venom or poison. For example, hate. While the antidote to hate is love. Despair. Well, if you're in despair, you need joy. If you're under stress, you need peace. If you're dealing with cruelty, then you need kindness. If there's wickedness going on around you, you need goodness. If there's untrustworthiness, then you need faithfulness. If there's overindulgence, you need self-control. And if there's pride, you need humility. And we all have to deal with pride. Every single person in the world has to deal with pride. That is the honest truth. We all have to deal with pride. Even the born again children of God, the ones who the Lord says are part of his family, the ones that he says are his beloved, every single person in the church that you know, including myself, have to deal with pride because it's a big part of the nature of your flesh. Now, I mentioned a while back in a previous sermon that we are a three-part being. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless unto our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. We are a spirit. We have a soul consisting of our mind, will, and emotions and we live in this body, this physical vessel. When we became a Christian, when we asked Jesus to become our personal Lord and Savior, only one part of us became a brand new creation. And that's your spirit. Your spirit got born again, made entirely new. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that. The other two parts, they did it. Our spirits became new beings with a nature. 
a brand new nature that wants to follow after God, desires to do the will of God, wants to follow the leading and guidance of the Holy Spirit. That's the nature of our spirit. That's its very inclination when we got born again. It's to follow after God. It's to walk with Jesus. The other two parts of our being, uh, not so much so. Our soul didn't get made new instantly. With our soul, we have a part to play in making this new. It's called transformation. That's why the Apostle Paul says concerning our soul in Romans 12 verse 2, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In James 1.21 it says, So get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts, for it has the power to save your souls. And there's a part that we have to play in where God expects us to accept the Word of God. He expects us to take steps to renew our minds, to be transformed in the way that we think, to think the Word, to think God-inspired, Bible-inspired, Holy Spirit-inspired thoughts. We are meant to transform the way that we think, to get our will in line with God's will, and that our emotions come under the Word, not our emotions being more real to us than what the Word says. And this is called the process of transformation. It's ongoing and it never ever stops. And here's two reasons why. Because this world is always speaking to you. And when I say world, I'm not talking about this physical earth. I'm talking about a system of belief, attitudes, of thinking that is opposite to the ways of God. That is ungodly, without God. That's what ungodly literally means, without God. So this world is constantly trying to get you and me to believe, to think, to have attitudes that are contrary to how God sees things. Now you turn on your TV, go on the internet, go to the news, read a magazine, and so often the message is, think this way, believe this way, have this attitude, act this way. And the world is always throwing its message towards us, and the message of this world is literally pride. Because we said last week that true humility is living in the truth. God says His word is truth, and that the ultimate in pride is when you disagree with God. And the message of this world is a message of overflowing and destructive pride because the message of this world disagrees with the message of God. And the world is constantly throwing a message of ultimate pride into your face and my face saying, this is the way. So that's the first reason why. And secondly, the fact that when you became a Christian, you and I became Christians, there was no instant change in the way that we think. We didn't suddenly start thinking Bible-inspired thoughts all the time. And because of those two points, it means we have to constantly keep renewing our minds to the Bible, to the Word of God. Now, the other part of our being, our body. When we became a child of God, our body didn't change. It didn't change in the slightest, not at all. So if you were five foot five before you became a Christian, you were still five foot five. You didn't suddenly become six foot five. So our body doesn't change whatsoever. Its nature stays the same, and its nature... A large part of it is pride. And honestly, it's not going to change ever. Your body's nature at this time is not going to change. The Bible doesn't say to renew our bodies. It says we have to discipline our bodies. 1 Corinthians 9.27 But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Now, later on in 1 Corinthians 15, it says that when the Lord comes and the church goes to meet Him, that in the twinkling of an eye, we will get these glorified bodies. And I'm looking forward to that. But until that occurs, the flesh, this body, still has the same nature. It's not renewed, can't be renewed at this time. It has the nature of the flesh, which has a lot of pride within it, and we need to discipline it. So we all have to deal with pride. And if someone tells you, that you have to deal with pride and you get upset at that truth. And it is true because we all have to deal with pride. If someone tells you that and you get upset, what do you think that is? No, we all have to deal with pride. It's a big part of the nature of our flesh and our renewed mind. But God has given to us an antidote to pride and that's humility. Here's the thing, you can't come to me and say, Pastor Matthew, I want you to lay hands on me and cast all of this ungodly pride out of me. I desire to walk in the freedom of who I am in Christ, so I want to be free of this foul poison. I, I can't do that. Your flesh is not renewed, and the world is constantly speaking to you and to me. No, we all have to take the antidote to pride, which is humility, and that's something that we decide to do as an individual. Humility is the antidote to pride, 
and we need to take this antidote because pride has devastating negative effects on us. I wanted to go over what happens to us if we refuse to take the antidote of humility. See in a natural, if a venomous snake bites you, say a king cobra or an inland typhoon, and they rush you to the hospital and they give you the antidote and they say, here is the antidote, take it right now. It will counteract and negate the effect of the venom and poison, making it null and void. But if you don't take the antidote, what occurs is that poison is allowed to work its negative effect upon, our, upon your body and that can result in our bodies dying. If we refuse to take the antidote of humility because it's a choice that we make, then the poison of pride will have its full negative effect in our lives. It will do this with a certainty. Now I wanted to go over very quickly the devastating negative effects that pride will have in your life and in my life. And this is by no means an exhaustive list of what it does. You can study further in your time. Read Proverbs. It speaks a lot of pride and humility. But I thought it would be good to go over just some of them right now. Now, pride brings shame. Proverbs 11 verse 2. When pride comes, then comes shame. But with the humble is wisdom. When you see people falling in shame, then you know that to a degree somewhere in their life, pride became present. This is how the enemy fell and became a pale imitation of what God wanted him to be originally. How the enemy came to be ashamed. What was it that made him fall? It was pride. Pride brings strife. Proverbs 13 verse 10. By pride comes nothing but strife, but with the well advised is wisdom. If there is strife between two people or a group of people, then pride is present somewhere. For example, husband and wife, parents against teenagers, employers against employees, neighbor against neighbor. If there is strife between people, you know that pride is present. It's impossible for strife to be present without pride being present. The Bible says that where strife is, there is every evil thing. That's in James 3.16. So where there's strife, there's every evil thing. So strife opens the door for every other evil thing to come into our lives. It's why the enemy tries so hard to cause strife in relationships and families, in churches, in jobs, in everything. Because he knows if you get into strife, then that will allow him to bring everything else that he has into that situation. Pride brings you low. Proverbs 29 verse 23. A man's pride will bring him low, but the humble in spirit will retain honor. Pride causes you to be a lesser person than God ever intended you to be. You'll never step into the fullness of God's plan for your life, His desires for you, the things that the Bible says that He actually planned for you to do before the creation of the universe. Pride will cause you to not walk in that, to not fulfill that plan that He has for you. And that's not what we want for our lives. Pride causes us to be dull of hearing. Psalms 138 verse 6, Though the Lord is on high, yet He regards the lowly, but the proud He knows from afar. It's hard to hear from the Holy Spirit if we are full of pride. It's like there's a barrier of smoke between us and Him. And you end up saying things like, I can't seem to hear from God anymore. Have you left me, Lord? No, He has said that He will never ever leave you or forsake you. The problem usually is pride. Pride causes destruction and stumbling. Proverbs 16 verse 18, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Humility is a huge blessing in our lives. Pride, however, is going to be a huge problem in our lives. Pride was a sin that Satan committed when he got kicked out of heaven. When he was still called Lucifer, which means morning star or light bringer. Now pride caused an angel who knew God, walked with God, to fall from his position, to go from Lucifer to Satan. Pride says this, if I can't be number one, then I'm out of here, I'm gone. If it's not my way, it's the highway. Now I should be the one that everyone listens to and everyone follows and obeys. Pride brings rebellion and disobedience and opposition to those in authority over you. Not just to the people of you, but to God as well. We end up disobeying the Bible and saying things like, well, that's scripture there. It's not a big deal if I don't follow it, if I don't do it. I'll just keep doing what I want to do, even if the word says otherwise. When we are in pride, these faults and actions will show forth in our lives. And like I mentioned, this is by no means an exhaustive list of all the negative aspects of pride. For time's sake, I have cut this way down. But as I've studied the Bible, I have not seen one scripture where God says that pride is a positive in any way. And if we don't take the antidote of humility, then pride will have devastating negative effects on our lives. But when we do take humility, then humility allows God to lead us 
into his blessing. Psalms 25 verse 9, the humble he guides in justice and the humble he teaches his way. I absolutely love this aspect about humility. It's the fact that God guides the humble. He tells them what to do. He tells them where to go. This is such a huge advantage because God knows everything. He knows what's going to occur thousands of years down the line. He knows what's going to occur tomorrow. That allows him to put us in the best place for our lives, in the best path for our lives, with the best result, with the greatest impact for his kingdom. He knows everything there is to know. I mean, on a side note, have you ever met someone who is a know-it-all? It doesn't matter what area of life that you talk to them about, they already know it all. I mean, cuisine, they know it all. They've never boiled an egg, but they are an expert on cuisine. Politics, they know the prime minister himself personally and have advised them personally. I mean, science, they have personally discussed the theory of relativity with Albert Einstein. It doesn't matter what tool or machine is around, they know how to work it properly. They haven't ever read the manual, they haven't been instructed how to do it, they've never seen the machine before, but they are already an expert. They know it all. What do you think that's called? I'll let you guess. I'll say this, pride tries to cast a false impression of knowing everything. Humility walks in truth. The humble see and acknowledge that they don't know everything. The humble can acknowledge their weaknesses. Back to God guiding us. It's hard for God to guide someone who is a know-it-all. But when we are humble, when we realize that God alone knows everything, then He can guide us into His blessing. The humble can receive the blessing of the Lord. There's a great example of this in 2 Kings chapter 5. So there was a captain in the Syrian army named Naaman. He was a very powerful man, influential, very well respected. He just helped the Syrians defeat the Israelites and everything was going great except that he was a leper. He had leprosy. So he captured a young lady from Israel and brought her back as his maid. And this servant girl finds out that he's a leper and then she speaks to him about this. 2 Kings 5 verse 3. If only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. Naaman could have thought, well, who are you to tell me what to do? I'm a captain. I answer to the king of my country, and now you, a slave, a, a woman, you're telling me to go back to the nation that I just defeated? I ran all over your people and asked those losers for advice and help? I don't think so. Naaman could have been offended. He could have dismissed it, turned away, could have got into pride. But he humbled himself and listened to her. Naaman told the king of Syria what the maid said. Humility will ask for help. Remember that, that's one of the aspects of humility. They are willing to ask for help. The king wrote a letter to the king of Israel on Naaman's behalf. He goes out towards Israel, the land he had just conquered. Think of the humility this took. He had to take the advice from a maid. He had to go to the king and ask for help. Then he had to be willing to go to another country and admit he needed help. Pride would have just stayed at home and refused to admit or even ask for help. So Naaman arrived in Israel, he goes to the king, who very quickly sends him on to see the prophet Elisha. 2 Kings 5 verse 9. Then Naaman went with his horses and chariots, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. Now we see this horses and chariots part of the scripture, and we might not think that much about this statement, but in our times, it would be like someone arriving in a limousine motorcade with the flag of their nation on the hood, and basically telling the whole world, hey, someone important has arrived. So Naaman turns up with the horses, the chariots, and a huge entourage, and basically he's telling everyone, I am a big deal. A very important man is here. And I'm here to meet this prophet Elisha, who's going to heal me. Verse 10 to 12. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, He will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. Are not the Abna and the Fapa, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. In just two verses of scripture, 11 and 12, we see some aspects of pride. Let's look at verse 11. Naaman says, he will come out to me. See, pride wants to be publicly acknowledged and seen. Pride hates not being noticed and acknowledged in public. That's one aspect of pride. Naaman also said, and stand and call in the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. 
Pride wants things done its way. Pride always has a better idea to God's idea. I'll ask you this. Do you always have to have things done your way? Does it always have to be the way you want things done? Anyhow, and lastly, he said this, Are not the Abna and the Fapa, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. I'm sure Naaman thought, does Elisha know who I am? Does he realize how far I've traveled? I didn't even get to see the man in person. He didn't even come to see me. And now he's saying, go dunk in the river, this dirty river, seven times. I'm going to look like a fool. Let's go home. What a waste of time coming here. See, on the way to your miracle, there will be plenty of opportunities to let pride talk you out of it. It may not happen the way you think or through the people you think. Stay open. Don't put God in a box. 2 Kings 5.13 And his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, wash and be clean? Notice again, it's not another military man. Not the prophet. The prophet didn't even come to see him. Not the king. It's just another servant. And the servant told him, if he would have asked you to do something hard, you would have done it. Why, why don't you do this easy thing? Naaman went to the river, washed one time, twice, three, four times. Nothing happened. He looked at his skin. He must have thought, if this was going to work, surely I'd be getting better by now. Surely there'd be some change. Or surely I'd be able to see some sort of change. Surely there'd be some change in the circumstances. He must have been tempted to get discouraged. But he kept washing five, six times. Nothing's happened. Imagine the humility washing in your enemy's river again and again and again. And every voice is saying to you, Naaman, you look like a fool. You're wasting your time. Naaman could have said this. Oh, wow, you know what? I might be a leper, but at least I have my pride. And he would have gone without. He would have let his pride rob him of his healing. Rob him of his miracle. Don't let pride rob you of God's miracle. So he goes down one more time, the seventh time, and when he came up out of that water, his skin was clear as a baby. He was completely healed. You see, healing this time was spelt H-U-M-I-L-I-T-Y, humility. And when you humble yourself and do what God's asking you to do, even when it doesn't make sense, you know, forgive the person that did you wrong. Be kind to the co-worker that betrayed you. Take advice from someone that you think you they, they don't even understand what I'm going through. You know, as you pass these tests, things will begin to change. The blessing is released in the obedience. And the way to be obedient is to walk in humility. Without humility, we're going to make excuses. You know, we're going to say, I'm not going to listen to the maid. What does she know? I'm not going to do this simple thing, wash in a river. And that's stupid. You know, you say to yourself, well, I've been doing this for a long time. You're right where Naaman was. The first six times, absolutely nothing had happened. There was no change whatsoever. That doesn't mean something is wrong. You're right on schedule. God's working on your pride and seeing whether you can obey in humility. The good news is this. You're about to come up from your seventh day where suddenly healing comes. Suddenly you're promoted. Suddenly you'll see that breakthrough. Keep doing the right thing. Keep obeying the Lord. You're close to your seventh time. Humility allows God to lead us into his blessing. 1 Peter 5, 5, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Humility is the antidote to pride. It's the thing that can negate and nullify this foul spiritual thing called pride. And we all have to deal with pride. Pride has devastating negative effects on us. If we don't take the antidote of humility, then pride will rise in our lives, affecting us negatively. And if it affects us, it's going to affect the people around us. It's going to bring shame, strife, dullness to the voice of the Holy Spirit, and many other negative factors. And humility allows God to lead us into His blessing. When we walk in humility, it allows God to lead and guide us into His blessing, into His miracle for us, into that change that we are looking for in our lives. Humility opens the door for God's miracle. Pride closes the door to God's miracle. Hey, I'm going to ask us to pray a prayer. And I want you to think really hard before you say amen to this prayer. Because I'm going to tell you in advance, I'm going to pray a prayer 
to ask the Lord to show us if there's any areas in our lives where we are yielding to pride and then to help us to remove pride from our lives. If there's pride in our lives, it's going to have a negative effect in every aspect of our lives. But if we can remove pride, if first of all, we've got to see it and then we've got to take steps to remove it and have humility flowing in our lives. But when humility flows in our lives, just like Naaman, he had to humble himself. But when, when he humbled himself, he saw the miracle of God. He saw the power of God released in his life. He saw the grace of God released in his life. And that's what we want in our lives. We want God's miraculous power. We want his grace. We want his strength. We want to see him do what only he can do in our lives. But if there's pride in our lives, it's going to be hard for the Lord to do that. So if you want the Lord to, to show you any areas of pride in your life so that it can be taken out, so that we can have the fullness of the blessing that God wants us to have, then just listen to this prayer and say amen at the end. Father God, uh, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And I ask, Papa, that you would open the eyes of our understanding and show to us, reveal to us, if there's any area in our lives in which we are yielding to pride. Because we want to walk in the fullness of your blessing. We want to walk in the totality of your plan for our lives. And if we are yielding to pride, we're not going to see the fullness of your plan, the fullness of your blessing in our lives. So that I ask that you'd show unto myself and to every single person who's agreeing with this prayer, any areas of our lives in which we are yielding to pride. And then give us the grace to, to address that, Lord. Give us the grace to walk in humility. Father, I thank you that when we pray according to your will, you hear us. And so we ask in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. One aspect of God's grace is saving grace. It's the impartation of God's forgiveness. And we all need forgiveness because we have all sinned. The Bible says in Romans 3.23 that we have all sinned. That's everybody and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, because we've all sinned, we all need forgiveness. But that's why God gives us saving grace. And it's the grace of God that gives you a fresh, clean start with God. It's the grace of God that allows you to stand before God clean, holy, pure, forgiven. God's saving grace is available for you and for me. And he wants to give it to all of mankind. But all we have to do is humble ourselves. Humility allows us to receive the blessings of God. And how do we do that? It's really simple. You stop putting your trust in yourself and you put your trust in Jesus. Faith alone in Jesus allows you access into heaven. Faith alone in Jesus allows God to give you this wonderful blessing called saving grace. Romans 10, 19 says, If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. There's a certainty there. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. Hey, we all need forgiveness of sins, and God has paid the price through Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. And if you want to take that first step in stepping into and receiving God's amazing grace that allows you to become a child of God and receiving that forgiveness of sins, all you have to do is say a prayer and mean it from the heart. And if you would like to do that right now, just repeat this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins. I turn away from living for myself and I want to live for you. I believe you died on the cross for me. You were buried and on the third day you rose from the grave. I ask you into my heart to be my personal Lord and Savior. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Come and take complete control of my life. Amen. Now if you prayed that prayer for the very first time, we believe that you just became a child of God. I want to encourage you to get into a Bible-believing church and keep God first place in your life. If you'd like to connect with us here at Go Church Bradford, you can do that via social media on Facebook, Insta, or Twitter, or you can email us at bradford at gochurch.cc. And for every single person who joined us online, thank you for taking the time from your weekend to connect with this church. We pray that you are blessed today. Love you all. Have an awesome week. God bless every single one of you. darkness.
us We were waiting without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt Oh 